Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live challenge check-in. We are actually, I think, pretty much halfway through the challenge. It's kind of crazy to think how fast the last three weeks have flown by. Um, we've seen some videos about different shaped blocks, and I'm just checking in to answer your questions and show you a little bit more uh, quilting inspiration. Because if we're going to be talking about help, how do I quilt it, we need to actually show pictures of quilting and see some different ideas. So what I'm going to do is kind of overview a little bit of the last two weeks because I haven't chatted with you since uh, the flying geese or the square in the square and show you just some pictures or examples of where I've used these on actual quilts and then I'll come back and answer a few of your questions and then I will send you along on your quilting journey so let's get to it okay so we started with the beautiful flying geese blocks and um, we learned three different designs now this wavy, wavy design is really one of my favorites. Um, even though I'm using it here in the triangles of the flying geese blocks, we definitely see it in other places as well. So um, one place that I see it a lot, hold on. We can see that here on a Tula Pink's quilt, um, Wayfinder I think was the name of the pattern, I've used it in those little flying geese. When it comes to the triangles of the blocks, I love a lot of different designs. And in fact, you can see I've done a little dot to dot quilting, a little bit of a different variation, but of course that wavy, wavy design. Um, it's just so fast and easy and it really adds a beautiful texture to the quilting. So once you get the hang of it, it really can be versatile and used in a lot of different ways. Um, again, same quilt, but you can tell I've used it in some bigger triangles. So these were actually, gosh, they're probably about six or seven inches tall. Uh, triangles in the border and so I thought about doing the geometric dot to dot first and I could not decide what to do in the other part because of that marble looking fabric I really didn't want anything to take away from that so I just did that wavy wavy design there um, remembering from the video the trick is to make the points closer together than the the base so that's going to help it fill in that triangle um, as consistently as possible other ways I've used it, it doesn't even have to be a triangle. I mean, we've seen it in the challenges before. It can be any kind of a regular shape. And I know this isn't the best picture, but it's a picture of uh, Tula Pink, another quote by Tula Pink, which she did uh, with hexagons. And just beautiful colors of fabric. Well, those rows of hexagons are pretty small. And so instead of treating each one separately, I joined them together and just did the wavy, wavy design. So no matter what area you're working with, as long as you use your wavy line to divide up into a triangle, then you can fill it in with those, those wavy, wavy lines. And again, here's just a border example of it. Now, if you've been through the borders, uh, free motion, borders and backgrounds free motion challenge, you've seen this before, um, but it's, it's a, really, a really good one. And I love Ellen, I just happened to peek up and see how do you get it to be wavy enough, right? You would think that being wavy would be something that's easy to do, but actually it just comes with your kind of body momentum. And I'll, I'll make a note and talk about that um, when we do Q&A. So we saw the wavy, wavy design. Again, another example of this, it's a frequency quilt. So this is from the Midnight Quilt Show. And it's a perfect example of using wavy, wavy as a design in all areas of your quilt. So the medallion layout has the pieced border and the, the simpler, more you know regular borders. And just using those wavy, wavy uh, in different areas really helps. And I have a kind of a closer up picture here. So the larger borders, but even in the narrower borders on the left, you can see just a little bit. So you can really fit this in a lot of places. So even if you're quilting it in the, um, you know, the flying geese block and you're thinking, oh, this is just too little to fit it into, I, I guarantee you can find other areas on your quilt that you can use this design. And I do like to joke that everybody can usually quilt a wavy line. Just try quilting it straight and chances are it'll, it'll turn out wavy. Um, and I think Karen has a question about the wavy lines as well. We'll, we'll definitely speak to that in just a second. Okay, so one variation I didn't show on the dot or the flying geese was the, the continuous curve. So how I go about picking designs out for the challenge is I actually quilt the panel a couple times to see what ideas flow. Because, you know, you can have an idea, but when you actually get to quilting, other ideas might pop up. And so continuous curve is one of my favorites. However, I didn't use it in the video because I feel like I have been talking about continuous curve a lot and we're going to see it again. So I figured, well, we'll just uh, leave this one out. But it's a perfect example of adding more of those curves to move your way around the, um, the, the area. I said it in the video, but it's, I can't say it enough. I always look at the placement of the block, where I need to go, how do I need 
to m maneuver around before I pick the design, and then I pick the design that will do that. And so this is just a perfect example of needing to go from one to the next and using that continuous curve to do that. And this is a slightly different example, or a more basic example, in the pieced triangles. So I did the continuous curve, um, leaving out one of the steps because those were pretty small triangles. But it just gives you the idea that's what helped me move my way along that area going from, from triangle to triangle. So picking the designs that are going to be mo most efficient is, is really the way to go about it. It just makes it a lot, a lot easier. All right, so one thing, <clears throat> sorry, one thing I didn't really get to talk about in the video um, is you don't have to just, when you're looking at your flying geese, you don't just have to think about the blocks. You can think about the space around them. And in this quilt, again, for Tula Pink, she has those beautiful flying geese blocks. Well, I used a little dot-to-dot -dot quilting around it to really kind of help group them together. If I have a bunch of blocks and I love them all and I, I really want them to be a unit, using the quilting will help that happen. Um, and so here you can see an example. So what you put around your blocks is important as well. Um, so within the blocks, I did the dot to dot design, that kind of V shape. That's the one I use a lot actually, but I wanted to show something with a little bit more um, designs in the video. And you can see the back of it here and you can kind of see what kind of cool secondary design it makes where those triangles come together. So we have the triangles here and then the space in between kind of makes its own secondary design. And I love when quilting does that when I don't have to do any, any more difficult work, but I get a more intricate look. That's always the best option for me. All right, so let's jump forward though to our square in a square. This one was difficult for me to pick designs for because there's so many things you can do. I mean, so many, but you know, I only have a limited amount of time and space. So um, this one was one that I used and you can kind of, um, if you've watched the video already, you've seen how you can leave the wishbones out or how you can, you know, do something different in the center. One thing I want to point out, I'm going to see if this kind of makes sense, um, and I'm sorry, I know the screen is cut off a little bit here, that's unfortunate, but when I'm quilting my way along that dot to dot, I, I stopped halfway through and then went and started the next one. Now, sometimes that can be difficult for some quilters because they're thinking, I want to finish this one and then, you know, move on to the next, and, and if that's the case for you, then do that. Um, just break thread and move wherever you need to go. I always try to say it, especially in my classes, you have to do what you're gonna do. And if, the, if you're not gonna be comfortable stopping a design halfway through and starting the next, then don't. Just you know, do what you will do, and I think that's the most important thing. I always try to straddle the line between showing you enough so that you learn, but not showing you so much that you're overwhelmed. Um, oh, I see you can't get it. <laughs> the swirl hook is giving some people trouble. Guess what we're doing next week? <laughs> we'll talk about that at the q and I made a note of it. Okay, so let's see this basic concept in a different, in a different context. So here we have um, Strip City from the Midnight Quilt Show. This is from the very first season. So this is like when I was just trying to figure out what the heck I was doing. Um, but even though we have a multi kind of layered block going on here, it really still is a square in a square, right? So what I've done in the block, instead of quilting that dot to dot design in both directions, I just did it in one direction and then added another echo line, just an extra line of quilting to fill in that space. So you really can have a fun time with this in other shape blocks, even though this one's on point and it looks uh, a little different. Um, what I think is fun about this is if you decide that you don't like free motion quilting and you wanna use a walking foot, you can do something like this with a walking foot, which makes it, makes it really easy. Um, or makes it easier to manage. So you can still highlight areas with your quilting using whatever method you, you prefer. Now, one thing I wanna point out about this design, and I said it, I think I said it in the video, all those lines coming to one point is really gonna draw attention to an area. So in this quilt, where all those lines come together, that's really gonna kind of pull the eye to that point. So make sure that that's one of your points that's, that's pieced well. Um, I, I always joke that um, I don't think I'm a better quilter than anybody else but um, I just, I'm just much better at hiding my mistakes than other quilters, so I'm, I'm used to, to doing that. All right, so next up, we have just a teeny tiny version of that same block. So this is a teeny tiny nine patch, which could be treated as a square and a square. I know it's not exactly the same, but it, it kind of is. Um, and so what we have here is the same idea, going from the corner to the inner block to the outer side, and you could tell that's a teeny tiny little piece, but you can still use that idea um, to, to work in those blocks, and I think it's fun to see it in different areas. All right. 
And another example, again, it might not look like a square and a square, but it pretty much is. It has the, the center and the outer ring to it. It's just a little bit more elongated. So again, adding more lines, adding those wishbones, um, definitely adding those in. So look to your quilts and, and think about like, okay, what's, what can be different here? What can I you know, treat just a little bit differently? Or what, what block can I treat like something else to make it easier to manage? So if you're looking at your block and you're thinking, I have no idea what to do, ask yourself, what does this look like and, and how can you manage it? Okay, so let's look at this quilt. So this is one I did for Tula for Quilt Market recently featuring her newest fabric line. For some reason, the name is escaping me. Um, but you can tell there's a lot of blocks and we've already seen some of these, right? So we've seen the cross block and the triangles, but what I want to show you kind of pulls everything together, what we were talking about around this little, this little square, right? So it's actually a square and a square block, but the background blends in so that you just see the center. But I used the quilting and I treated it just like a square and a square block. So, you know, when you're looking to your quilt, look for those little hidden areas. It's a great way to highlight a particular Thing. It's a great way to uh, really show it off. And again, you can see the wavy lines again coming up there and a couple other, you know, fillers around it. So it doesn't have to just be the block. It could be something else for sure. Homemade. Yes, that's the name. Homemade is the name of the fabric collection. I don't remember the name of the quilt though. Okay, so let's look at this other square and square blocks. The second one, we saw the little boxy kind of design with a little starburst in there. And when I'm preparing for these little live presentations and pulling all these pictures together, it's, it's kind of fun to walk through um, a quilting memory lane there a little bit. And unfortunately, every picture I had of this little starburst just wasn't very good. So I don't have very many pictures showing that, but you can use that as an all over on your quilts. You can just quilt the tops and it will look like grass. I mean, you can do a lot of different things with just that little design. You do it vertically, it looks like snowflakes. So it's, it's a pretty fun little design to use on your quilts and I'd encourage you to try it. The boxy, out, the boxy um, design in the outer ring of the block is a go-to of mine. I just, I love it. It's so fast, it's so quick. It works on all those blocks of different sizes. But like I said in the video, it doesn't matter how big that outer block is, it just depends on how close your lines are. So if you want it to be less dense, just spread your lines out. If you want it to be more dense, you can put them closer together. And just like I said in the video, you might notice that mine are a little bit more mid-century modern, right? Because I have a little bit more rounded curves to it. I think it looks fine. I, I don't, I don't, I'm not worried about it being perfect, but if you wanted that kind of perfection, um, you could definitely use a ruler or take your time. This is a design, however, that I probably would not do with, um, with my walking foot because it would be a lot of turning. And the more you have to turn, the longer it's gonna take. So you kinda have to wrestle with that and find you know, what it is that, you, that works for you. But this is just a little baby example of that particular um, block, of that particular design around a block. So I couldn't find a whole lot of really good pictures of that one either of, that I've done through the past, but it, it's really a really good one, especially it could look a little bit more masculine. I know somebody asked that, you know, what quilts, what designs could you use on a masculine quilt? It can look modern, but it can also look traditional. Um, so it, it's, it's kind of fun to use in a different, in different ways. Okay. So this guy was kind of my straddling the middle a little bit. So I try to have a design that has a little bit more depth and a little bit, um, and then one that's a little bit easier to see it come together. And this one just kind of combines the both. So we know that echoing is one of my favorite things to do. It's a great way to highlight a block. Um, also keeping it curvy in the corners makes it a little bit easier to manage, but you'll notice there's a little bit of stitching in the ditch on that particular block. And there's a question that came up about that, that I'll definitely address at the end. Like, do I go back and, and handle those, those seams? Um, I guess I could just answer right now. When I'm, when I'm quilting, when, as I'm stitching in the ditch, you can tell, especially like over here on the bottom right, that I didn't get every seam. I don't actually, I don't come back and worry about those. I don't stitch them down. You can tell that some places get two lines of stitching and some, you know, don't get any. I'm not too worried about that. Now, you probably shouldn't do anything that I suggest and plan to uh, win a ribbon at a show. I'm just talking about quilts that, that we love and cherish and that we want to get done. And so, I'm not worried about it, even if it shows up in the back of the quilt, because I figure I can only worry about one side of the quilt. It might as well be the front. So it's kind of um, up to you. 
But there were other designs that I worked on that didn't make the cut. So these were some of the designs as I was practicing and thinking through that I ended up um, leaving out. So this next one is echoing with the ribbon candy. And I swear, it's like you all are reading my mind just a little bit because I was looking on the challenge group and it was um, questions about ribbon candy. And so the reason I actually left this out is because I used ribbon candy. And so for some reason, ribbon candy is one of those trickier ones to quilt. So um, we'll have to include that in a future video since so many people were uh, curious about that. Uh, the square spiral in the center, those straight lines, it's actually really easy to quilt and it's a great way to bring the eye to the center of the block. But I, I decided to save that for next, uh, next week. We're going to see that next week in the stars. So, but it's a good example of how to quilt something like this and, and really kind of you know, add a little bit more detail. Again, these little echo lines, just two little echo lines, I think really kind of gives it a more custom look, um, but it's not very difficult to do. All right, the next one we have here, I ended up not using because it looks too complex. So we have the dot to dot quilting on the corners and the center. Uh, the way it comes together is pretty easy but at the end of it, it looked pretty complex, so I, I decided to leave it out. But it's a really great way to highlight the center with the quilting. So that dot to dot in the sides is kind of all orientated toward the center and really kind of pulling it out. But it's a good example of how the straight line quilting can combine with the curvy and give it a nice look. And this is definitely something I would do on a block that I really want to show off or that I really love the person that I was quilting it for because it does take a little bit longer, but it's, it's definitely a fun effect for your block. All right, another one that I had played with, it's a variation of the first one that, we, that I did actually use, the dot to dot quilting. So just kind of connecting those points and, and adding a little bit more uh, geometric. I love this one, but in the end I just, I just ran out of um, time. So left this one, we'll left this one for later. Now, those of you that are asking to see some stuff on long arms, I, I have videos. I just haven't had a chance to edit them all, but we'll see this one done on a long arm eventually. So just have to, you know, get to it. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up the different designs that I was going to show and the designs that we did show. And so now um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and answer some of the questions that, that you've asked. And, kind of address any of those issues that you might be having. So um, one of the questions I already kind of addressed, if you leave it a seam unstitched, do you need to go back and stitch it down? It's up to you. You can handle that however you like. I don't worry about it. The thing about quilting is when you put more quilting around it, all you eventually see is just the, the overall texture. You won't see that little individual line. But I also quilt pretty densely on a quilt, so even if that seam is unquilted, it's not gonna be super noticeable. But again, you can kind of wrestle with that and find your own preferences. Um, okay, lots of questions about ribbon candy. On the challenge Facebook group and then also in the comments, um, I totally understand the thing about ribbon candy is it's one of those designs that has a mirror image, right? So you quilt it and you flip it, and you quilt it and you flip it. And it's those designs that you think, I got it, and I don't got it, and I got it, and I don't got it. So when you're working with that design, if you just are having trouble quilting it, try drawing it over and over again. Your brain just has to kind of get that click and then, that, then it will come really easily. So I do have a video on wishbones and I'll, I'll search it up after this is over and put it in the description box on, the vid, on this uh, live check-in so that you can look at it. But the thing to remember with that, if, if I had to give you one, just one little tidbit, not being able to demo or anything, I would say on the wishbone, make sure you go out enough to come back. So what happens is sometimes we don't go out enough, we kind of come back too soon. You have to leave to be missed, right? You have to go away to come home. So I don't know why I keep doing my hand like this, like it's gonna help you visualize that, but the idea is when you're making that round, make it nice and nice and round. Okay, um, another question that came up was how, this is on the challenge, uh, Facebook group was how to feel less awkward quilting with rulers. When you're quilting with rulers on your machine, it's going to feel awkward. It's kind of like what I would imagine the first time we held a pencil, right? It just feels like this weird thing. Um, then, you know, pretty soon you're going to be whipping it around like a ninja. So the trick is to practice, but you hate that answer. But the trick is also to try different uh, orientations and different hand placement. You'll find one that feels more comfortable to you. 
So when I'm quilting with a ruler, I like to work in a vertical motion, even if that means the ruler is sideways, just I prefer that method. But if you, you might find that you like working horizontal, so just don't be afraid to, to try different hand positions. And even if that feels weird, you're, you're kind of working through it and figuring it out, figuring out what you like. So that will really help you get less awkward with it. Okay, wavy lines, all about the wavy lines. So when you're quilting a wavy line, you cannot laugh at me, but you have to really get your body momentum in it, right? Because your body momentum is gonna to have to help carry you through that line. So if you're just trying to move your hands, it, it'll it work, but it's a little bit more difficult. So kind of get into the sway of it, if that makes sense at all. So if I'm quilting a straight line, I wanna move just my arms, I wanna move smoothly, I want it to be, you know, in one motion, but if I'm going in waves, I kind of want to get my whole body in. And those, same for those of you on a long arm. I mean, you kind of have to get your whole body into it to get that, that wave down. Um, think of it as a, a momentum thing. You know, I, you don't want to keep the wave too regular. It's not like you have to worry about that, but you just kind of want to get used to rocking back and forth. Now, I will say that if you're having trouble in the flying geese with that wavy line, maybe try it in the borders or the strips in between the blocks because sometimes when you're learning to get a wavy line, getting that wave going in just a small area, when you have to stop and change direction is tricky. So learning it first and then breaking it up into the pieces to do the design will make it just a little, just a little bit easier. Um, and, and again, also working in the direction that feels comfortable for you. I love to work vertically because I can use my whole body to push back and forth. So, or like Denise said, say wiggle, 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 whatever it takes. I talk to myself all the time because, you know, I gotta ask the expert of my opinion. But yes, definitely get that whole body going. Now, if you're worried that you look weird, well, if it's another quilter, they'll totally understand. Um, okay, swirl hooks. So somebody mentioned on the video, like getting that swirl hook down is, is a little bit of a trouble. The, the swirl hook is another one of those designs that just, it'll click with practice. Like when you're learning the regular swirl meander and you're practicing, it gets better and it gets better and eventually it kind of looks good. With a swirl hook, what happens is it, it it's not working, it's not working, it's not working, but all of a sudden it clicks and it connects in your mind and they're like, ah, oh, then you can do it. So if you're struggling, don't get frustrated. Um, definitely check out, I have two different tutorials on it, on the swirl hook, it's that good of a design. But next week, we're gonna see it in a star. So we're gonna be working within a defined area. So what happens is it kind of makes the space more manageable, it kind of takes away the the question of where to go next. And I think if you're having trouble with swirl hook, hopefully next week will really kind of help that click in your mind. Now for my long armors out there who are like, where are the long arm videos? Um, I really try to keep the YouTube videos right about 10 minutes. And since we have so, you know, three or four different designs in a video, I've had to kind of cut out the long arm, but I do have them recorded on the long arm. And I've been kind of putting them out as I can. Um, if you go, if you have a question about any videos or any handouts or anything, if you go to my website, quiltingismytherapy.com, there's a free motion challenge tab, or you can put in fmqchallenge.com, it will take you there. That's kind of a landing page for all the challenges that I've done. And the very top one is the help, how do I quilt it? And you can click on that, and it will take you to the page that has all the videos, has all the handouts linked to each video, it has the, the bonus videos at the bottom. So check that, check back on that pretty often because that's where you'll find everything in one place. I'm super excited. It only took me, what, like a year and a half to get that all together, but it looks beautiful. So if you, um, I have some long arm videos on there and I'll keep adding them more definitely as we go. So the thing to remember though, I know it helps to see on long arm, but I think as long as you know where the, the design flows, it's, it's easy to adapt that to the machine that you have. Um, so good question, Christine. The borders or the strips in between, go ahead and do them however you like. I know somebody asked if you could do something different than ribbon candy. I have loved seeing on the free motion challenge group what people have been putting in those borders. So um, do whatever you like in there, but I will tell you that I'll address the area around the star, all that negative space in a video. So you don't have to worry about trying to decide there. I'll give you some options for that bigger um, area because I love the negative space. So last question, um, and then I'm gonna probably let you go to your quilting destiny, tiny, the tiny wishbones. I didn't say this in the video and I probably should have. When you're going from really tiny to really big, it, you, you might feel like you have to put little tiny wishbones in there, but you don't. Just quilt that line until you have enough room and then go into it. So as when I run out of room, it just turns into a line. So don't have to feel like you have to make them really tiny. Just go until you have room to do it. Of course, if you're like, oh, I just don't like that, then you can just put some wiggles in there, 
put a filler or leave it out altogether. You can definitely, definitely um, have that. So thank you so much um, for ch uh, checking in and chatting with me and looking at the pictures. I hope I've answered a few of your questions. Of course, remember, you can always go check out the Facebook group where other people can kind of chime in and, and help you out with that. And I'll see you next week when we talk about the star quilts. I'm looking forward to that. Thanks so much and have a happy, happy quilting.